Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Mikel Del Rosario, Cultural Engagement Manager here at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And our topic on The Table podcast today is making sense of strange Bible passages. My guest coming to us today from sunshiny California is Dan Kimball, lead teacher at Vintage Faith Church and an associate professor of leadership and theology at Western Seminary. Welcome, Dan. And welcome from Santa Cruz to you. And it is sunny outside. I'm looking out the window right now. So there is sunshine here. Do you miss the Golden Coast? Very cool. Now, Dan, you help people better understand the Christian faith and that there are good reasons to believe Christian truth claims, but it was not always so. So before we get into our topic, why don't you tell us a little bit about your spiritual journey? Yeah, I was raised in uh, Paramus, New Jersey, which is in a suburb of New York City. And I didn't have any... Um, I didn't have like church upbringing and I wasn't actually a, uh, you know, I wasn't an atheist or uh, I wouldn't say I was a, even an agnostic. I probably would have said, oh, there's some sort of God just culturally mm -hmm. thought there was God. And then I went to Colorado State University and um, it was there during your college years where I read a little tiny tract that uh, a campus club was handing out. And you never know where these things lead. I didn't ever went to the campus club, but that little tract was saying there is only one way to God, and that was through Jesus. And I can just remember that as a college student, just knowing like the Christians really believe that. And I had no, I still, it had to be God because in my mind, I was sort of like, God, are you there? Is this true? Because mm -hmm. what a, I had never assumed that there was just one religion. I thought they all were okay. And that got me on a quest. Um, searching out the origins of scripture and and then my friends who weren't Christians, this is actually a very important part of my story was that my friends who weren't Christians and the, um, the girl that I was dating at the time, they were concerned for me when I started reading the Bible hmm. because they're wondering, are you going to be getting into a cult? What is this mm -hmm. Christian thing? You know, it's the dead man came back to life. How can you possibly believe that? And, and at the time, you know, all of the end times, Tim LaHaye stuff was very in focus uh, culturally. So there's an awareness of, are you waiting for the end to come? And that really stuck in my mind because it wasn't that they were anti-Christian. They were just concerned for me believing something that may not be true and uh, or even in danger of getting into a cult. So for me, I was very cautious about taking steps of, is this true, which got me into apologetic books and all different types of things. Josh McDowell mm -hmm. in those early years was actually very important because I'm like, look at these books. I didn't know there were resources to read about this and eventually put my faith in Jesus in London, England, while I was in a punk rock band in a tiny little elderly church. And that's another whole story, but it was through searching out, could this be true, which God used in my life to um, show that, that there was truth and God's spirit took over basically and and showed me that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that you were in a rockabilly punk band in London. Is that a telly behind you? Yeah, I'm a drummer, but this is a Telecaster. Yeah, I keep this to just plunk along with every <laughs> now and then. But uh, drums is my instrument, but I can strum some chords. So I sit here sometimes and play with that. That's pretty awesome. We've had John Dixon on the show as well, and he was in a band too. Yeah. And, uh, I love having musicians who are also into apologetics work on the show because as a singer and guitar player, sometimes people be like, how can, how can you be Mr. Logic and also be emotional in music? And I say, well, I can respond better emotionally to something if I'm convinced that it's actually true. No, right. No, I've gotten to uh, uh, meet John and it was such fun to hear his musical background and he's such a genius thinker. So, um, and culturally so aware. That's, that's mm -hmm. what I love about him. Immersed in culture, very culturally aware, yet super sharp theologically and um, apologetics, not as a weapon, but as a means to discuss Jesus with people and truth in, in a way that he relates to them there in Australia. Mm -hmm, definitely. Now, you wrote a book called How Not to Read the Bible, and the yes. subtitle is Making Sense of Anti-Women, Anti-Science, 
pro-violence, pro-slavery, and other crazy-sounding parts of scripture. I have to tell you, it was a very good read. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, really condensed down some of these complicated Bible background questions and helping people you know, navigate through tough questions about these confusing texts that are sometimes used to discredit the Bible. What inspired you to put a book like that together? Yeah, it was being... Um... I mean, it was something I almost like couldn't help but do, even just because of just ministry um, in Santa Cruz here. And I've been, you know, constantly in the mix of younger people's lives and thinking for years and years. I was uh, on staff at Santa Cruz Bible Church for 13 years, and then we planted the church that I'm in now out of that. But it, it always been involved with like college ministry and Santa Cruz is a very, um, you know, progressive mm -hmm. thinking uh, and politically everything place. So you're kind of forced more to, to, if you're a believer here, to really kind of think through what you believe. And what I've noticed over the years, increasingly so, is that we have Christians less and less, even growing up in good churches, knowing scripture. It's, you know, the statistics show it, and we just see that there's, we're more of, I don't know if the word illiterate is the right word, but biblically illiterate or less knowledge people, even if you grew up in churches. Therefore, with that climate, what's happening now with online access of information, and when I say atheist, anytime I mention atheists as we're talking, I'm talking about the you know one or two percent or whatever it is of the activist atheists. Most atheists that I know are just wonderful folks that leave people alone and Christians alone. And then there are the act activists that want to disprove the faith. So mm -hmm. when I'm saying atheist, I'm not talking about the, the folks that are um, not, not activists actively trying to disprove Christianity. But the ones that are have taken to online and using it as Christians do as well to you know promote their message and one of their main messages has been towards Christians and a lot of Christians that don't know their Bibles. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is they're creatively, wonderfully creatively, uh, putting together memes, you know, putting together a verse from 1 Corinthians about women being silent in the church. They're not allowed. It's disgraceful for them to speak. Mm -hmm. Putting the actual Bible verse with, you know, an, a graphical image of a woman with her mouth taped shut with the Bible verse underneath it and putting it up online is very, very unsettling to anybody that sees it. Mm -hmm. But if you're not, if you're a Christian and you're not familiar with that specific text, or it can feel like I didn't realize that was in the Bible. Yeah. You'll see it with verses about slavery, you know, like slaves obey your masters and seeing these put up on memes. Some of the atheist groups have rented billboards actually, and put up, Again, I'm crediting them for their creativity, you know, but putting up graphics with Bible verses underneath it and then challenges, read your Bibles, this is in your Bibles, you know, vi a lot of the violent passages. And, and the reason I wrote this book was I'm starting to see and hear as not just locally, but all over Christians who are starting to have their faith undermined. Right, generally in the young adult years, in your 20s, maybe into your 30s, maybe starting, you know, is my faith my own, all the deconstruction stuff mm -hmm. that's going on now, and using the Bible to discredit their faith. And that was the response that I, I ended up writing this out of like, I have to, because these are good questions, but there are responses. Mm -hmm. And so it was basically out of need. And this is a very serious thing that's happening all over the place, um, you know, and you're just hearing it in stories over and over and over again. And it's that combo. I don't know the Bible very well, and I'm now seeing verses being brought up, generally out of context, graphically put together with memes and other creative forms, and it's catching Christians off guard and causing them to doubt, discredit their faith right at times when they're wondering about their faith. And all the deconstruction stuff going on. Um, so that's why I wrote this, because mm -hmm. it's uh, it's unsettling seeing how many people are seeing the Bible as evil versus yes. good today. That's right. More than just the Bible being irrelevant, as it used to be. Uh, 
put forth. Now people are putting forth this idea that the Bible is actually an evil book and an immoral book. And so we'll get into some of the, the specifics that you had mentioned in terms of uh, women and slavery and some issues surrounding those texts. But generally speaking, how would you advise Christians to begin to respond or even make sense of these, these strange sounding Bible verses that come up in conversation? Yeah, well, I would, for one, I would, the Bible is filled. I mean, the Bible is a wonderfully, amazingly 100%. You know, my, my premise is always it's 100%, 100% inspired every word in the original documents, you know, so um, that for those that will hold that and then say, then there's got to be reasons for these verses being in there and to mm -hmm. not panic. There are wonderful uh, scholars out there that can help us. And, um, and I would really plead church leaders and parents to be teaching about these things earlier on. So um, if some, I would just, I mean, I might raise this up throughout. I just can't stress enough to both parents and church leaders that we have to be teaching basic Bible study methods earlier on and just address some of these really tough issues like slavery, pro-violent sounding verses, anti-women sounding verses, because they're starting to hear them. So let's not let them get caught off guard. Let's teach about these earlier on. They've always been in the Bible, so this isn't like something all of a sudden new that's being brought up. But um, that's what I would advise. But but we're, we're kind of at blame, if you think about this. We have, for a long time, and in, in I'll say America, you know, the global church is diverse all over the place, but say generally in America, in the evangelical world, we've had it somewhat easy and it's been easy to be a Christian overall. And, uh, and so, and we've focused so much on the nice verses, you know, always the positive things, which you want to be doing and coffee mugs with nice verses on it and, and, and memorizing just the nice verses. Of course we want that, but we've been, often even pulling out verses without explaining their context and using Bible verses like that. And what's happening now is the not so nice sounding Bible verses are being brought to attention. And so that's what's going on. And again, they've always been in the Bible, but we need to prepare people to understand how to respond to them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I like how you spend a lot of time in the book, setting the reader up to think more like, the original audience, or at least as best they can. Uh, we call that transcending your horizon in scholarly speak. But, you know, as far as you can, just recognize the Bible uh, was written in a whole different time and place. And uh, we need to think a little less like modern people when we try to understand what the Bible is trying to say and trying to teach. Well, let's. You, you mentioned a couple of really big uh, important ones at the outset, but let's start out with some some quick ones. Um, and and for those of you who are interested in the women and slavery issue, we're going to get to that toward the end. So stay with us for the duration of the show. But let's start out with some quick ones. Um, this one's just kind of a uh, I don't want to say it's it's funny necessarily. Some of the memes are meant to be funny, but does God hate shrimp? What a weird question to ask. Some people say that Christians cherry pick from the Bible because we're going to champion things like natural marriage between a man and a woman. And yet the very same people who do that um, will also have no problem eating shrimp, um, even though it says in Leviticus 11.9 that you can only eat animals that uh, live in the water if they have fins and scales. And this actually came up in the San Francisco area when I was a youth pastor. So how do we help people um, think through this, first of all, and then how do we help uh, young people respond to this? Yeah, well, what you're seeing, again, we talked about this, it's in, uh, it's not just an academic discussion. It's not, it's like seeped into pop culture, you know, like mm -hmm. say the shrimp one. So many people see this. There is a website, I haven't checked the past couple of weeks but there was a website, GodHatesShrimp.com, and you know, there's memes with, uh, you know, shrimp with, you know, um, crosses through them, like you shouldn't eat them. God hates shrimp, basing it out of the verse in Leviticus chapter 11. Um, so it it certainly reads interestingly, and you'll see it quoted all the time. And the it the basis of all Bible study methods, not just for shrimp verses or anything, is okay. It does say that pretty much don't eat shrimp. And then you have to be saying like, where is, and this is at least in the, the book, the whole front part was like some basic Bible study methods kind of like crammed in mm -hmm. quickly because one of the biggest ones was the timeline, you know, of the Bible. 
when was something written to? Who was it written to first? And mm-hmm. if if I had one thing I wish Christians would do was really understand the timeline of the Bible. Because when you do, not with all the dates even, but just at least a progression, because then, oh, this is from Leviticus, so who was it written to? It was written to the people of Israel after they were uh, coming out of the Exodus, after 400 years in slavery in Egypt, and God was giving them some instruction while they were living, surrounded by other people groups, uh, not to pattern themselves after worship practices and keeping them holy and distinct. And then you see all these very oddly written uh, rules about certain things or uh, guidance, and one of them is about shrimp. And you just have to, anyone that quotes that today, they're and say, why are you Christians being hypocrite? They don't realize that's not applicable to us today. It was for the people of Israel at that time. When you look through the rest of the Bible story in the New Testament, you don't see the food items being relevant for what it means to follow Jesus today in the New Covenant. It did matter back then. That's why when you study the New Testament, you then see murder doesn't stop. Like murder doesn't say, do not murder and, and most of the, the sexual ethics that were in the Old Testament, they still carried through the New mm-hmm. Testament. You have That's to right. see which ones carry through and which ones didn't. And the food ones like shrimp didn't carry through. So when people mock Christians using this verse, I understand it, but then they are picking and choosing and cherry picking their own way, not mm-hmm. looking at where it fits in the hole. So, of course, Christians can eat shrimp today if they so choose it's not going against the scriptures whatsoever if you actually look at the Bible storyline there. Mm-hmm. That's true, yeah. Um, I like to call that the Acts 10 um, diet yes. whenever we have, uh, you know, all, all our, our you know, shrimp and uh, lobster, uh, shellfish extravaganza. Uh, and interestingly, in the history of the church, um, fasting often, that's what they would eat is actually shrimp uh, in place of in place of meat. Um, here's another kind of fun one that you have in the book, playing football on Saturday. My son actually saw this. My son's a high school senior. And uh, he actually brought this to my attention. So I'm glad that you had it in the book. Leviticus 11.8, it says on the meme with a guy playing football, actually verse seven mentions pigs. And then it's verse eight that says, you shall not touch their carcasses. They are unclean to you. What on earth does that have to do with football? Yep. Well, um, I I think what's uh, maybe even ironic about this one is that, um, you know, you'll see it a lot, uh, football players, there's memes of football players with this verse written below them, like, look, you're touching the pig skin, playing <laughs> football, and you shouldn't do that. You're viol- If you're a Christian, you're violating the scriptures. And the irony of this also is that it made the show West Wing. You know, if you've ever, if you type on Google West Wing and Bible, you will see that this very example made it to a, um, um, I'm sorry, was that the Golden Globe award winning? I'm Mm. forgetting the name of the award, you know, the TV show. It was a very prominently watched TV show a decade or so ago. And this made it through all of the screenwriter, the script writers, the actors, like no one caught this, that it's such a false premise to even um, (laughs) start with. But basically the answer is there is, There is a verse, again, written just like I talked about with shrimp, Mm -hmm. to the people of Israel at that time period saying, don't touch the skin of a dead pig for a bunch of different reasons that had to do with whether it was worship practices. There's all different thoughts about it. But you go to the New Testament and you can eat pig, um, uh, um, touch the pig. There's there's no – that command does not carry through into the New Testament very clearly. But here's the the odd part about that is that the the joke of this whole thing is that very prominent people in a, in a national television show say you shouldn't then touch pigskin because it's saying you know footballs are pigskin, but the the word pigskin was simply a nickname for footballs. If you go back to Europe, like medieval Europe. They were taking deer skin and a pig bladder, blowing up the pig bladder because it functioned like a little inner tube, wrap it in deer skin, and it got the nickname pig skin. When we then started the American version of football, the nickname pig skin carried on, but footballs are not made of pig skin. It's either cowhide or they are uh, synthetic uh, materials Mm. that make a football. Right. So, so. It's not even a valid thing to criticize about, yet it makes T-shirts 
uh, television shows <laughs> and memes. Mm-hmm. But, and we're in a world today, again, that's just, four Christians are guilty of this too, are not thinking. We're surface, just see surface things, assume things, and not going down into, let's see if this is accurate. What are the facts behind this? So, the fo- anybody can play football. And it's just so ironic that I keep saying the TV show, but it just shows, I'm going to use the word like respectfully, but like madness of mm-hmm of these criticisms that have no validity um, and because pigskins aren't even made of actual footballs aren't even made of actual pigskin. Right. So do you think these memes are all negative or do you think there's actually a positive role that they can play? Oh, in- I, I love, I love them. I mean, all right. I used to, I said this, let me say this the right way. I love them because it's challenging Christians to look at what we believe. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's, I, th- we should be open to challenges, you know, unless we're in a cult cults don't want you to think Christians should be open to every kind of challenge, every criticism of the Bible, always be wondering, you know, how do I know I got it right? Or is it just the particular school that I went to or a particular author that I read that was teaching a certain way? Um, I want to be open to all types of viewpoints and re- always ex- Never be afraid to test the scriptures to see if what they said were it's true. Uh, the Bereans tested Paul and it was commended as a good attribute. So, um, saying that, um, I think it's actually healthy and it's a good thing. And I welcome the memes and you can use them as teaching tools. If I was, we do this in our church. In fact, in our church, we played that West Wing video on a Sunday, the whole thing. It's like three or four minutes long. And he lists a whole bunch of these kind of Bible verses that he quotes. And in the in the clip from the West Wing, the Christian is stumped, can't answer, just sits there like the dummy and and like, look, I know the Bible better than you Christians. Look at all these Bible verses that indicate God's for slavery, killing people and all this stuff. And uh, so I play that clip and then I said, what do we do with this? And I said, come back next week and we'll walk through it. And then we... Hmm played the video again, and then we stopped and walked through every one of his criticisms using Bible verses to show how to respond to them. Uh, Youth group leaders, young adult group leaders, or in churches, use memes, put them up on the screens and say, how do you answer this? And have the uncomfortable feeling, like, I don't know how to answer it. Mm -hmm. I can then Mm -hmm. show there there are responses. Uh, I know for some that might be listening to this just on the audio, there's a uh, book out that's called Awkward Moments. I'm showing it on the screen on the video. Uh, Awkward Moments Children's Bible. And uh, and you can see the cover is Noah's Ark with all the happy uh, animals, but then on the water, and this is uh, shown, looks like a children's uh, color, I mean, children's book. It's done very well, but then there's all the dead bodies floating on the water. And this book just takes Bible verses and then we'll put children's kind of graphics to them. Um, and it's trying to show, I, I don't even want to show you the, some of them are very, um, I mean, I can just show you, I'll show you this one. It's like women that there's the Bible verse about women being quiet and you can see they have women um, with their mouths, uh, you know, on mm-hmm. do, like a, you know, like a dog basically mm-hmm. saying, look, your Bible's saying to muzzle them pretty much. Mm-hmm. And on the back of this book, it says, um, it talks about how many Christians think of the Bible. You're, most were raised in the church, raised in faith, chosen by their family. Young kids learn a few Bible verses taken out of context and accept them without question. After decades of repetition and tradition, it's understandable that we might put our beliefs on autopilot and just nod as a pastor repeats the verses and ideas that are already familiar and comfortable to us. It's no wonder that recent studies show an increasingly lack of biblical knowledge among Christians. And then they give some stats about how poorly Christians um, know the Bible. And then he says, our goal is to get to pe- get people to really just read the Bible and think for themselves. So they're just trying to show Bible verses. Again, this is through children's artwork to uh, say, do you even Christians do you even know it's in your Bible? So mm-hmm. I think it's a great teaching moment and wake up moment for the church. Mm-hmm. Well, let's go ahead and go there right. because the woman thing has come up a couple of times. So there is that popular meme with the woman's mouth taped shut. And uh, even in this children's book that you showed us, um, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 is quoted on the graphic. Woman, 
should keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak. Now, this was also painted on the back of someone's truck in a picture that went viral. How do we go ahead and think through something like that? How do you help your church work through that? All right. Well, I would just, walking through the process, I just say, okay, that is an actual Bible verse. That's Mm -hmm. not, it says, women be silent. Go home and ask your husband the questions. Um, It's a disgrace. The NIV, I think, uses the word NIV translation, grace. Uh, It is a disgrace. It is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Okay. That's a Bible verse. So, of course, I read that verse. I'm going to put some graphics up like I just showed. And how do you explain that? Mm -hmm. So, again, what do basic Bible study methods teach? All right. Who is this written to? It was written to the church in Corinth, a city in Greece. In modern day times, no, it was written to a group, um, you know, Back probably a church that Paul founded around the AD, around AD fifty one, sometime around then. You can go back. Wrote this probably around AD fifty five. Like we're not sure exactly the dates, but somewhere in that time period. Mm-hmm. So what was going on? New churches, new beliefs, pagan other beliefs coming in. There's some different thoughts about the about what this could be by great scholars that it might have. Like it could be this, it could be this. But here's the here's the the blunt uh, response. Paul couldn't have meant women don't be silent and talk at all because three chapters earlier in the same letter, he's telling indicating for women to pray and prophesy in the church. Mm -hmm. He can't be talking about the way it's now taken as a mockery and looking at, you know, saying that, and there's all types of customs of learning that was going on back then. And uh, it's too long to, you know, get into all now, but I'll just say, you can't just take it in a surface value because three chapters earlier, and when you read other letters of Paul, women mm-hmm. obviously were speaking in church meetings, so he could not have meant, be silent, don't ask anything. There's more going on there. So, um, it's just, but again, it certainly makes a great meme and a great uh, graphic and can mock Christians really easy by looking at those verses, pulling out of the context, pulling out of any of the study without any explanation, apart from a graphic with a woman with her mouth taped shut. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, and it's often the case that it's easy to ask the hard question, or it's easier to ask the hard question than it is to find the, the hard answer and listen to the hard answer, um, doing the good work of Bible backgrounds research and seeing what was going on in the churches in the time. And praying, uh, arguably, is praying out loud. You know, the prayer that Jesus gave his disciples, the Lord's Prayer, is something that was done out loud. So certainly people weren't just uh, praying silently as well. Um, elsewhere in the New Testament, you can see where uh, in First Timothy talk, talks about disturbances in the church, and it, it would be understandable if uh, in certain cases there were women who were causing a disturbance, that they would be asked to listen quietly and not cause a disturbance. So even if we can't nail down exactly what the situation was, what you're saying is there are, there are plausible um, situations where it doesn't sound like it's being made to sound in the meme. No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the that's the it's the same thing with most of these verses. Is that, uh, and again, we have been guilty as Christians of doing the same thing with the nice, happy verses. We didn't teach the basic Bible principles of why these verses may communicate what they do. So, in many ways, we're reaping uh, a lack of teaching biblical hermeneutical principles to people, uh, even with the happy verses. And now these verses are being. Written. But most of them, like you said, and I, and I wrote pages on this very topic, so I just gave a quick answer. And there's great scholars who talk all about this. So um, it's not just what it seems. But again, most people just respond to the images and then like, oh, look at what it says and doesn't don't think about it more. So, um, you know, just like the claim, like that the uh, the guy that you mentioned that made national news he put that verse on the back of a his pickup truck, and then it says, read your Bibles. Because, and he's an atheist. He's interviewed in the news clip, and he's an atheist saying, Christians, read your Bibles, because if you do, you'll see these verses that are anti-women, pro-violence, pro-slavery. If you read these verses, you'll become atheist. There's, there's themes of, uh, you hear the mantra of this, the fastest way to become an atheist is to read the Bible, because mm. if you read the Bible, you'll see all the stuff that you haven't really read before, and you will become an atheist. Mm. And that's a consistent thing. And 
what I get, I can feel my whole body reacting to this now hmm. because my concern is there's so many younger people, right? When you go through the different stages of learning and growth development and faith development, it's good to question things. You're going to question things. I questioned things when I was in college and uh, I still question things. All the, We should always be asking questions, mm -hmm. but right at the time, when a lot of young adults are starting to question, you know, do you make my faith my own? Or is it just my parents? And I can tell you this, yeah. I've heard so many times I asked my parents these questions and they couldn't answer it at all. Now I love, and here's the other thing we have taught in our churches. Maybe I'm speaking more to church leaders here, but we have focused so much in our churches on the music, which again is important and video venues and good parking lots and uh, and all of these things, which are important, but when I'm talking to so many of these people that leave faith, and and I've done a lot of interviews with deconstruction folks and listened to many of the stories, most of them came from very uh, alive, vibrant churches with good music and relevant preaching. It isn't that we have that backwards, but we're not teaching some of the basic um you know, Bible study methods at an earlier age, get into apologetics at an earlier age. I think it's madness when people say, we don't need apologetics. I'm like, I think we need apologetics and theology all the more. And the good news is I think people are interested. We were talking about this before we started the recording. Mm -hmm. I talked to, in our, in our church, uh, I, regularly, I'm talking to non-Christians who are intrigued when you get into what was going on in the city of Corinth. And you put a map up of Corinth on the screen and you start talking about who founded the church and what, what were the other faiths that were going on in a Greco-Roman culture and what are the possibilities of what meetings were like and learning postures in, in these house church meetings that were going on. Non-Christians are so intrigued by this. And I've seen, I've heard stories, multiple stories of people coming to faith when you're getting into this stuff, not just, and, and that's why I really believe I'm so optimistic about mm -hmm. all of this, but we need to take this seriously because it's causing people to abandon faith when they're not getting the answers or they're already using it like or they use it as an excuse to abandon faith. Um, but we got to proactively be teaching this earlier on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, helping people to see Bible backgrounds and see the 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 whole context of the entire Bible, of the whole library of Scripture, and how this particular concern fits in is kind of giving people the other part of the story, you know, the rest of the story that they're not getting just from the meme. Well, uh, the, the, the rise of the Bible Project, you know, the video mm -hmm. um, up in Portland, you know, with, with Tim and John up there. Yeah. It's so fascinating because, like, is that, you know, they're not, like, felt need all... Um, it's not a felt need, you know, how to have happy marriage or just different things that are important teachings. They are getting into the storyline of the Bible, the context, the culture, you know, the breakdown of how a book is written or a letter is written. And, and, the, and it's fascinating to see the amazing response, both by Christian and non-Christian to Bible project videos. That's why I have a lot of hope that if we start teaching theology and scripture, I think I think that is a major, um, mm -hmm. I mean, the, out, the new outreach is, is theology in, in many ways. So that's yeah. the, op, again, the optimistic part of things is, is that. Yeah, teaching the theology of the human person and, and just how um, God sees men and women together, um, you just really see the other side of the story because I think the concern about women be silent is does the Bible demean women, when in fact, Christianity actually elevates the position of women from where they were in the various cultures that we see in scripture. Um, just looking at the meme, you won't get how Priscilla taught Apollos was already debating people on, on Jesus being the Messiah in the synagogue. You won't get how Mary is held up as the model disciple in many ways, um, of how women were the first witnesses to the resurrection. So they're not going to get that just getting the, the soundbite or the meme. And so really showing the whole context of uh, biblical teaching. Uh, All entrusted the book of Romans to Phoebe. <laughs> That's like, right. I mean, uh, I, mean I, I heard N.T. Wright make a case saying, could Phoebe possibly have been the first expositor of the letter to the Roman church? Mm -hmm. uh, because if the, if the letter carrier was the one that was then explaining what the writer meant, That's right. then Phoebe, a female, may have been the first uh, expositor of the book of Romans to a church. So, 
I mean, that, that's why, again, you look at the whole trajectory of the whole scriptures, mm-hmm. even in the Old Testament, where that was definitely was female oppressive and there was polygamy and so much horrendous stuff with women. But then you'll see like glimpses of, 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 you know, Miriam and Deborah and different people, Huldah and prophets that were women that were, that were brought up in, in a very patriarchal culture. Yes. But God isn't the one who said just demean all the women, you know? So again, it was, that's the same thing without getting to slavery because each of these talks we could spend an hour on, you know, but slavery, God did not, uh, in, he did not invent the slavery or command the slavery. And New Testament slavery and Old Testament slavery are entirely different things. You can't, um, you know, you have to study them differently, those two verses, because there's entirely different cultures that Old Testament slavery existed in and New Testament slavery. And the other big thing is we can't read our own American lens of of the evils of the slavery that took place since the Civil War was all about, you know, like that was kidnapping slavery from Africa, bringing people here against their wills. And it was evil, 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 evil. That's that's condemned in the scriptures, that type of slavery. So we can't be reading in our modern day thinking into and even you're looking into cultural practices of the time. So that's why we can't we have to go back and be better students of the Bible. Uh, and that's where so much of the misunderstanding takes place. Absolutely, for sure. Mm-hmm. But the Bible does have very, very difficult things in it. I don't know if you want to get into violence, but that to me is the toughest one. But it's not the violent, crazy God that people um, uh, portray him as. But the, mm-hmm. Bi- the Bible does have violence in in it for sure. The cross was violent, so. Yeah, well, with the time we have left, I'm not mm. sure we can go there right now. But uh, he he does uh, tackle that in the book. For those who are listening, um, you can check out the book "How Not to Read the Bible" um, to get more um, ways to interact with these challenges that are leveled against Christianity. With the few minutes that we have left, uh, I want to ask you this question, because another part of your book talked about the exclusivity of Christianity. Yes. And a couple of years ago, we did a a podcast with uh, the Barna research uh, people, and they they found that nearly half of millennial practicing Christians, 47%, according to their study, say it is wrong to evangelize. Yes. And beneath this, it seems to me, is being uncomfortable with the objective, the exclusive claims of Christianity. So, as a as someone who's working in the church and um, speaking to young people, how can we help people work through this this uh, aversion they have of making um, objective statements about spiritual things? Well, again, I, I said knowing the storyline of the Bible um, that in the beginning, when you know the whole storyline, you know God created one God. Karen Armstrong in her book in the History of God even wrote that say uh, uh, it's like a non-christian book that looks about the history of god developing in the world and she'll even say that there are primitive forms of mo- uh, monotheism that they have records of in the beginning so if you did look at if there is one story and god started it in the beginning and then you'll see the development of the promise made to the to abraham and on and on through israel then jesus was born through him um, it's one true story that's out there and as the human beings spread across the planet, uh, they started other world faiths, but it doesn't mean that they were then, there's one true faith from the beginning. And so we have to, again, teach on this. So Jesus's statements about being the way, the truth, and the life for all of the other ones, there's one mediator between man and God and the man, Jesus Christ. Like all, all of these verses aren't just wicked sounding little exclusive verses. They come from that story that began back in Genesis. Mm-hmm. So again, it comes on the, the weight of pastors, teachers, parents, make sure that you are teaching these things earlier on. Um, I have an assumption today, like we have a seven day a week coffee house in our church that is open to the university, the university of California, Santa Cruz. And uh, it's been gone. It's been out of meeting for over a year. So we're going to be re-seeing students coming back. But, uh, and then we have, we bring on, uh, it's, they join church staff. So they have to be Christian to be, joining the church staff that serve in the coffee house. But I can say this, we have an internship. We have seven new interns coming in uh, in two weeks or something like that. So, uh, and we ask questions. I survey people a lot and we always ask questions of them coming in. 
my assumption now is if you're under 25, you are, um, you are, don't believe Jesus was the only way you are pro-choice and you are theologically affirming, you know? Uh, so I just, that's my assumption now, even if you grew up in, um, I'm making a church up Dallas Bible church <laughs> or something that even if you grew up in that church, when you're asked those direct questions, probably half of you, at least that's what you believe. That's just, that's normative today. And that's, what's alarming. That is why we have to be going back and teaching these things earlier on because the cultural winds are so strong and, um, and that's how we deal with this stuff. So, you know, again, I address some of the symptoms the underneath, the, but, but again, the good news is once we do teach, it then makes the other things make sense, but it really is the responsibility of the churches to be, and parents to be teaching these things. So that's my pleading with everybody is that we got to take this seriously because it's undermining people's faith or it's seeing, and this is another topic, so many Christians raised in churches are then saying, well, the progressive way is the way, and there's no tension. I, I couldn't be a, personally, I couldn't be a progressive Christian to be an agnostic because it doesn't take the scriptures as all inspired and anything can then go. So, but that's what's happening because then it's easy to be a Christian and the difficult things, like you said, the exclusivity of Jesus as the one way of salvation through him and he's the savior, you know, like that's, that sounds horrible or that sounds, you know, what, you know, um, self-righteous or arrogant, but if it's true, it's unloving not to say it. And that's, uh, that's what we have to say. It's unloving not to then tell people if he truly is the way. Mm -hmm. And that's why I do what I do. I'm an introvert. I don't like getting in front of people. Mm -hmm. I, I, but uh, when I realized that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life, and started understanding through apologetics and thanks to Josh McDowell and others, you know, about the, these bases of, boy, I, I can't help but want other people to know this. And that's what I dedicate my life to because there's so much confusion out there today. And it's really sad. We can't, we can't just take this as a side issue um, because this, if we lose faith, trust in the scriptures, everything disappears because then it's just a Jesus we can make up which is happening or a salvation that's we make up and it's just, it's, and, and without, without the truth of the scriptures, we're going to be making up all kinds of different mm -hmm. Christianities that may be yeah. very different from the whole of the Bible. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dan. Our time is up and it is, it went so fast, but thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Well, thank you. I mean, out of the table, I mean, watched you, you know, when you're on video and you're doing it back in person and things. And, you know, Daryl Bach, uh, it's like, you know, I remember I met him at, in San Francisco very briefly and I felt like I was with a rock star. <laughs> I'm looking at him. It's like, oh, I got all nervous actually when I met him because I, I so look up to scholars. I've been to Dallas Seminary several times, um, went to the leadership week there when Howard Hendricks was still around. And, and so I just, you know, Bill Hendrick, I just can't thank you for being faithful and all the training that you're doing there. So I'm just honored to be serving with you. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think we've walked away from this conversation, at least with the idea that we can see uh, most of these memes are distortions of what the Bible actually teaches, but we need to get the whole story in order to understand the text. And we need to learn how to read the Bible and how to not read the Bible. So please uh, check out Dan's book. Again, it's called How Not to Read the Bible by Dan Kimball. You can check that out. We'll drop a link in the description of the show. I'm Mikel Del Rosario. We hope that we will, you will join us once again next time on The Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth, love well.